Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. Proudly hosted by me, Chris Little. Without further ado, let's get started. Well, welcome to episode 30 of the Lifestyle Chase. I have with me today, Case Kenny. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I'm good. This is awesome. Like I, I stumbled across you because I was looking for kind of like mindset podcasts. I kind of felt that it was good for me to be listening to other people's podcasts if I was going to have my own. And sure. so it's I've loved it because you're just a normal, real dude. And it seems <laughs> to work for you. Yeah, man. Right on. Uh, yeah, it definitely, definitely works. But yeah, no, I appreciate you listening and finding me. I love, I love the uh, the internet bringing people together. So that's great. So take me through uh, one of your busiest days of the week. What do you do? What's your routine? Busiest days of the week, man. Uh, I mean, I would say that's probably Wednesday. Just so like, so for background, uh, I have a couple of different things going on in my life. I do host the podcast, New Mindset Who Dis. I do that twice a week. Uh, but then I run a company called Pursuit, which is a daily email um, focused on self-development mindset content. Um, and that's it's a pretty involved undertaking. So that's an involved process. And then I actually also, I still work a job in Chicago. I run a, a sales team uh, at an ad advertising technology company. So between those three things, I have a lot of quote work going on and uh kind of i think if you think about the work week you keep pushing things off and off and off you get to like wednesday or thursday or you've got a lot going on and i publish new uh, new mindset who does episodes every thursday and between that and all the other stuff it's it's a busy busy day so i find myself really scrambling i usually um, for my podcast i don't do guests so it's not like i can just like hope that we'll have a good conversation it's all of my own original thoughts and i i usually try to take a lot of time to make sure i have a good well-structured show and i'm really um you know bringing some value so that takes a while that usually takes three to four hours per episode so you add that to a full work day and then you add that to all the uh the requirements that pursuit has in my life it, that's a busy freaking day for me Absolutely. but uh, i i found that as a writer i've got a bit of a process down now where i can write hop out right hop out right hop out and then by the end of the day i've got a full full like uh, uh outline ready to go so i make it work but yeah it, could, it can get pretty hectic Totally. Do you have like a way that you wake up? Like some people, they'll journal, they'll meditate, they'll do this, that. What What's your way of waking up? Yeah, I wish I had like a better answer for that. I'd love to be that guy who's like, yeah, I get up at 6.30 and coffee and journal and meditate. Uh, not so much the case for me just because I, I, I've never been a morning person and I still haven't cracked that code. So I, I roll out of bed at like 7.30 and it's like shower straight to work pretty much just because of the product that I run with Pursuit. It's a morning email and we're still basically working on it in the morning. So my I haven't fully optimized my mornings, let's just say, <laughs> but it's kind of a roll roll into it and, and keep going. But it, it works for me. I always find they pack, you know, 25 hours into a 24 hour day. But yeah, I don't I don't have the best morning routine. I'm the first to admit that, but I'm getting better about it. But uh, yeah, I kind of just roll it, roll out and, and go hit the pavement. Yeah, and I, like I honestly think that's so good to talk about because some people will tell you like the coolest routine ever, and like they're they're totally faking it. But then other people will tell you a routine and it's legit. Like you could follow them; they'd be doing the whole thing. But to get that perspective that hey, like we we all have a different way to be at our best, I think that's that's empowering because it allows us to kind of cut some slack on on ourselves. We don't we are not as hard on ourselves thinking that we're not doing everything that we should be doing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, it, you look online and any any website, any podcast, anything that's dedicated to self-help, self-improvement, whatever, there's always a morning routine thing thrown in there. And I find a lot of the times I feel guilty reading those things because, you know, like, wow, these people are they're, they're really making the most of the morning. They've got they got more done in the morning than I did all day, like all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, man, I, I think the, the grass is always greener. Like you do what's right for you. I don't, I don't see any negative impact to my morning. I think I can make it better for sure, but I'm going to make it better on my time, my, my terms. So yeah, I think you, you do whatever works for you. And right now I've got a lot on my plate. So my morning kind of reflects that if I could kind of be more efficient outside of that, it might be different, but for now it's the way it is, but I, I still 
get a great night's sleep. I roll up. I roll out of bed. I feel grateful for the morning, and I'm ready to rock. So, yeah, I, I don't I don't think people should feel the pressure to over-optimize their morning. Like I think there's a lot of pressure to do that. You just do, do what works best for you. Absolutely. So tell me about your favorite day of the week. Like if, if you could pick your favorite based on, like, how fulfilled you feel and, like, the things that you enjoy. Tell me about that. Uh, I love Sundays, man. I love Sundays in part because I love Mondays. I think a lot of people dread Mondays, but I, I mean, I'm always working. So I, I love getting back to the grind. So I love Mondays, but I love Sundays in particular, because for me, that is a very grateful day. That's a day where I am very intentional and I sit down and I definitely take time to reflect on all the things that I accomplish, all the things that I'm grateful for. So that's very, a very intentional mindset driven day for sure. But Sundays, I just like Sundays, man, because you know, for me, that's a day where I write pretty much all day. It's a day where I create and record um, podcasts. And it's a day where I just focus on the upcoming week. And to me, if you listen to podcasts, I talk all the time about how I'm a very glass half full kind of person. And Sunday is like the start of a race. It's like anything can happen. And I'm just so amped for that week. So, I, I you know, I'm not perfectly level-headed mindset wise throughout the week it's a lot of ups and downs i feel great i feel bad but like sunday is almost always just a great feeling of gratitude and just like optimizing towards the week because it's right before that week i'm creating things i'm getting ready to go so i love sundays man absolutely so uh what what inspired you to start pursuit yeah uh i mean it's it's a couple things i mean for most basic it's i've always loved writing I've always been a voracious reader as well. And when I started working in Chicago out of college, I wanted um, something to kind of fulfill that creative itch I had. Um, I was like, well, I want to continue writing. I'd always written either creatively or like I wrote for my university's newspaper for four years. Like I want to get back to that. Um, So that was the idea. And I kind of... uh, It wasn't as an entrepreneur, I went through a lot of pivots, so it wasn't always what it is now. But um, eventually I kind of found my niche where I realized that the power of perspective is what I've always called it. The power that writing can have in your life, uh, being a catalyst to inspire you to change something. And I realized that through my own experiences. And I was like, wow, you know, I have the power to do this as well. So I really just leaned into that um, and then kind of just realized that when it comes to, you know, self-help content in quotes, because that's what people call it, it's self-development, whatever. Um, to me, there was kind of a gap there as far as relatability, as far as how authentic content was, and no one was doing it in email. Pursuits the daily email. Everyone gets, you know, is obsessed with the, these, you know, daily emails that help you catch up on current events, um, all of that. But there's you know, the emails that make you smarter, things like that. But I, I haven't seen a really well constructed large email that's focused on helping you become a better person. And yeah. to me, I was like, well, that's. To me, that's more important, candidly, than being caught up to, on current events. So uh, I just started it, and it kind of blew up over the past year. And you have quite a bit of contributors for it now, right? Or um, so so contributors wise, uh, at our peak, we had close to six hundred. We had some like big boys, Gary V, Mark Manson, James Altucher, guys like that. And then we also had anyone can submit and we had an open submission policy. Um, we still accept submissions, but um, we're trying to figure out the best way to make the content standardized. It's really tough to accept submissions, but not have it be kind of the same kind of voice. So for now, um, I actually write all the content. It's from my first person point of view, not because I'm <laughs> egotistic and think I have great points, but just because I've found a way to craft a voice around self-development content that I think is more transparent, more authentic, and more relatable. So for now, we're leaning into that, uh, but working on different ways to get more people involved. I love it. Uh, as far as writing goes, what would you say is the first thing that you wrote? Like, like think back, think back to the days when you were start starting to write in like elementary school and stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, I remember. I mean, I, I remember writing like a book quote book call it i don't know it's like probably like 12 pages in like fourth grade it was like a a book about a soldier and he like uh got sh- i remember writing those i don't know why i wrote this the, like he got like shot down in the war and was like escaping and i wrote a first person narrative of that so i was I mean, you know i was a pretty standard kid always writing about war stuff but i remember writing that that one pops out and from there i was always just writing different um kind of like fiction type stuff yeah but yeah man it goes way back. 
What was your favorite uh, books to read? Name a few of your favorite authors. Uh, Pat Conroy, great, uh, great, the great Santini. That's my favorite book of all time. Uh, that's a fiction book. It's about a relationship between a father and son. It's really good. The father's like a general. Um, but for now, honestly, I read a lot of nonfiction. Yeah. I haven't read fiction in quite some time. I've gotten really, I mean, I, it makes sense for me. I got really into, uh, self-development content and that comes with it a lot of nonfiction type type stuff. So I, I read a lot, uh, of that, uh, Mo gaudet has got some really great books. I read a lot of Mark Manson, um, just the, so many authors, but, uh, yeah, I, I read a lot of, of nonfiction for now, for sure. Yeah. I can relate to them the same way. Like yeah. the last, uh, fiction book I think I read was Harry Potter and then it ended there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it was probably that and the great Santini and some stuff thrown in there. Uh, but yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I, I'm a pretty realistic, pragmatic guy, and I, I just find a lot of value in things rooted in reality. But there's obviously, there's obviously a ton of value in reading fiction for creativity and things like that. Love to get back to it. I just uh, I'm stuck in a in a groove right now, so I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> Absolutely. So in high school, what kind of kid were you? Were you like a nerd, a jock, a little bit of everything? What describe like your day to day back then? Yeah, uh, I, I would say I was a little bit of both. I mean, I grew up in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. I went to a really small school. There was like 72 people in my senior class, so really small. Um, but, you know, I was on the, the lacrosse team, won state championships. I was a starter. Like, I was really good at lacrosse, but I was also the, the solid Victorian of the class. So take that for what you will. It was a small class, so a smaller sample size. But very, I always got A's, did really well on SATs, ACTs, but – I wouldn't consider myself a nerd in the aspect of being a smart nerd. I was more of a forced nerd in that I really forced myself to study. I don't think I'm particularly IQ intelligent, but I am very stubborn when it comes to things. And I, I will study my ass off to, to get it done. So, yeah, I'd say high school, uh, I, was a bit of, I was a bit of both for That's sure. Awesome. I mean, I played lacrosse, that was it. And then everything else was just, you know, academics. Yeah. Uh, when you were in high school, did you have like this plan for what you're going to do for school? And is it any different to what you're doing now? Uh, it was definitely very different. So, um, I had an older brother. He's, I'm 30, he's 32. Um, he graduated, he went to Harvard. Um, so I think, you know, coming out of high school is my plan to also go to Harvard, um, and do that. I didn't end up going to Harvard, I ended up going to Notre Dame, which is also a great school, but going in there. And then my brother went out to be a doctor. I kind of looked at his story. My mom was a lawyer. My dad was a consultant, pretty traditional career path. So I looked at those stories and I was like, you know, I, I'd like to be a lawyer or I'd like to be, I'd like to be a doctor as well. And started the whole pre-med course and everything. But ultimately within a year, I figured out that that, that wasn't for me um, and departed pretty radically from that. In the end, I ended up studying and majoring in languages at Notre Dame. I uh, majored in Chinese um, and Arabic as well. And then I lived overseas um, and then coming out of that, though, you know, I graduated, moved to Chicago, started working at an ad agency. And while I was there, I was like, I don't want to I don't want to do this forever. I need to get a career path. So I, I um, from a nod from my mom, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a, an attorney. I'm going to be a lawyer. So I started taking the LSAT and things like that. Learned quickly. I didn't want to do that. Um, and then from there, it was honestly around there that I started pursuit. I just started leaning into things that I was more creative towards, inspired by, fulfilled by. Uh, which was writing and entrepreneurship. Um, and then, you know, that was eight years ago. And then from there, I kind of just, I, I stayed in the same industry, which is kind of marketing advertising. And there's just, you can go so deep there that I found a lot of different ways to fulfill both my creative side as well as my entrepreneurial side and, and need for, you know, financial security. So I made it work, definitely moved very far away from traditional career paths, or at least the paths that I thought I was going to pursue initially. Uh, and ended up here. So I'm, I'm glad I did, honestly. It, but, you know, it was from, it was trial and error for sure. Yeah. Um, and I tested both, but, you know, now I'm here. I'm very happy with it. Absolutely. What was the toughest lesson that you learned in, in this whole journey from going from what you thought you were going to do to doing what you're doing now? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the toughest thing is it's, it, it was always tough to know if I was doing the right thing. It's not yeah. like, Nothing. It's not like you try something and then it's black and white. And you know exactly the right move. It's like 
you know, you got to just listen to your gut. So it was, it was tough decision, tough lesson after tough lesson, because it's not always clear. You got to basically listen to yourself and say, okay, I am not a hundred percent in. So that means I'm a hundred percent out. And that was kind of my mentality. I was like, you know, I could probably force myself to be a lawyer. I could finish the LSAT. I could do it. I can get a job, but like, I'm just, it doesn't speak to me. So with that, I'm not a hundred percent in, I'm a hundred percent out. I'm gonna stick with what I'm doing and just go deeper. And then that, that kind of mentality encouraged me to just keep going deeper into marketing and advertising. And I ended up moving around a couple of different agencies, met some people, got another job, and then really just kind of found my stride as far as what I was good at, which ended up being sales. And then continued to find my stride with creativity and then found something that I was really fulfilled with, which is podcasting and pursuit. Combine the two, and I've got a really winning formula now. So yeah, it was definitely, I mean, took eight years, but that's the process. Um, and it was kind of just leaning into my intuition throughout the process. Absolutely. Like I have so many friends who would say the same thing. Trust your gut, trust your gut. And so yeah. many other guests on this podcast that have changed their jobs or like what they thought they were going to do at first completely changed into something totally different that not many people would agree with. Right. Like, uh, one of my guests, uh, she is the owner of a vegan based like cafe and Alberta is like the, the Texas of Canada. And so to like have, have a vegan based cafe with no beef in a place yeah. like that relies on beef, that's yeah. tough. And she made it happen and had lots of naysayers, but she did it and she yeah. trusted her gut. <laughs> I love that analogy. Yeah, dude. But I mean, it's tough. Like people love the advice of trust your gut, but then when it comes down to the reality of it, it's not like, oh, so I'm just going to trust my gut. Your gut's a confusing freaking place to be. Yeah. Like everyone's got multiple voices in their head that are going to say things. And that's, that's what listening to your gut, your intuition is. So yeah, it's, it's tough, but I think the more you practice it, the more you can come in touch with yourself. And it, I think it leads you to good, exciting places. And I've learned that for sure. Absolutely. I want you to think of two other times when you trusted your gut, you weren't quite sure about it, but then it paid off in the end. And tell us a little bit about it. Uh, I mean, I can think about, I mean, like relationships. I think it comes up with relationships uh, all the time for me. I mean, I've, I'm in my 30s and I, I'm 30. Let's see, I'm in my 30s. <laughs> I'm 30. I'm going to date myself. I'm 30. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've dated a lot and I've had some very serious relationships that, you know, uh, I ended or were ended and I decided not to, you know, uh, follow. And, you know, that was a result uh, of that as well. I mean, I think, I think there's so many areas that were, were tough decisions, but we're, we're led by that recently, for example, um, it was very amicable, but pursuit, I actually started pursuit four years ago and then partnered with uh, a couple of great guys um, to form a company together. And recently we, we parted ways. I ended up buying back um, aspects of my company. Um, it was basically a divorce, if you think about it. And that was all initiated by myself for various reasons, amicable reasons. I love the guys, nothing wrong there. Um, but just from a, a, a responsibility standpoint, value standpoint, like it needed to be done. And that was a really tough decision. And I went in circles over that in my head with my friends, with my family, trying to figure out what to do. And ultimately, it just came down to knowing trusting myself that this is what I wanted to do and was best for myself. And in fact, I almost folded the business about six months ago. Um, I was like, you know, I, I don't know if I can continue doing this um, and almost shut it down. But then it was listening to myself, knowing where I see it going, the potential of it, and you know, how much we can continue to scale it. And that I, I didn't make that decision. Um, I made the, the other decision. And I think that, again, was derived from listening to my gut, making a tough decision. But uh, all signs point that all those things I just described were the right things for me to do for myself personally. Absolutely. Uh, what would you do had you closed down pursuit? Like what, what would your next step be? Did you, did you think that stuff through? Yeah, I did. I mean, if I closed down pursuit, I would focus on the podcast full time. And honestly, honestly, the podcast is really taking off right now. I've got a ton of brand deals. I have an agent, I have representation, like I'm flying around to do different things. It's really, really been quite humbling. So I would have been, I would have been fine for sure. Um, but for me, it's, you know, I, the, the value of pursuit as an entrepreneur, as a marketer um, is, is, is really there. Uh, but as a creator, like I love to write. 
Mm -hmm. and I want to write for an audience. Uh, and Pursuit has almost 200,000 daily subscribers. And when I hit send, it goes out to hundreds of thousands of people at once. And I want that because I want that feedback. You know, no author wants to write without a, a voice to be heard. I want it to be heard. So to me, that was a very intrinsic reason for keeping it, um, you know, that, that fulfillment there. Um, but yeah, it would have been fine. I mean, I could have continued, you know, working in, in ad tech and whatnot, but um, the decision was, it was definitely the right one to make. Absolutely. Uh, what first inspired you to start with the podcast? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, the answer is twofold. I would say the answer first was to challenge myself. Uh, I think I became very adept at writing in my voice. I developed a great voice, but writing, writing, you can hide behind your writing a lot. Like it's not, it's you, but you can hide behind it. Podcasting, I think takes it to the next level. You really have to showcase yourself. You have to create the brand yourself. You have to be creative. You have to be clever. You have to be entertaining. You have to provide value to do all those things. And I saw that as a challenge for sure. I think I've come a long way personality wise over the years. And I saw this as the next kind of frontier. So I saw that as a challenge and I wanted to do it. Um, so I did, and it seems to have, have done really well. Um, but you know, second, you know, I, I, I wanted to, challenge myself in a second way and that I wanted to come up with content of my own. It's very easy to write and you kind of borrow from ideas here and there and all this stuff. But the podcast inherently for me is talking about my life and what I've learned from it. So it really has encouraged me to be creative in that sense. Um, and I would also say the reason that you know, I could have started the podcast a long time ago and people have been saying for a while that I should, but I, I held off for the very specific reason that I, I always think uh, as either a, a brand, a marketer, or just as a writer or a creator, um, when you create something, you have to stand behind it and that you have to give reason, give merit to your voice. Why should people listen to you? Why should they believe your advice over someone else's advice. And my mom is an author and she has always said that, you know, Case, you're gonna be a great author one day, but you need life experience first. You need things to reflect on, you need good things to happen in your life, you need bad things to happen into your life. That's what fills you with emotion and passion and just the spirit of writing. And I took that to the podcast and that I was like, I can create a podcast four years ago and just spit generic rhetoric about how to be your best self and mindset hacks. But it's the same thing that you'll go find on thought, thought catalog or medium. Like there's no value there. So I wanted to wait until I'd grown up a little bit, frankly. So I waited until I was 30. Yeah. <laughs> I waited until I had gone through seven, eight relationships, th three business partners, five jobs, moved cities, lived overseas. Like I wanted to live through all that first. So I had a reason that I thought I could help people. Without that, it would just be me kind of conjecturing over things that I think might be helpful. Um, so that was my reason for waiting so long. And then the reason once I got started again was to challenge myself. That's awesome. I, I can relate to that because when I was fresh out of high school, I was thinking I was going to do film school. And my whole thought was I didn't have a vision. I didn't have anything to tell about. And yep. film school is expensive. And like you, you're not guaranteed yeah. to get a job from that. Right. And so I did this big roundabout circle. I did like a warehousing job. It was good money but just not not my thing it wasn't fulfilling for me and then now i'm in the fitness industry but then i also do a lot of media stuff like like this podcast i started in september um but it's yeah it's so true just like you need that life experience to be able to speak from life experience i'd say like it's it's neat to see another person say the exact same thing that's been like on my head for so long yeah, man, I, I couldn't agree more. That's the right mentality. I mean, I think uh, it'd be it'd be easy just to sit there and, and talk. But like when you talk from your own experiences, it's so much more valuable to other people. And that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, like I want to help other people. Um, but I think also like podcasting is cool, especially if you're doing something in the development space and that like it helps you too. like I've come a long way. I think personality wise, confidence wise, just being centered through the process because it forces me when I come up with content for an episode, it forces me to think about my own life and things that I do. So like the very process is very meta and that it's causing me to change myself and go deep. So I, I think podcasting is fantastic or really any creative field. What's the most rewarding feedback you've ever had on your podcast? 
Oh God. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I have like, I honestly, I'm so humbled. Like if I'm ever having a bad day, I'll just go like read my reviews on iTunes. Um, cause just, they're, they're so humbling. It's insane. Um, and I have screenshots of all the DMS that people give me. I mean, I, I mean, I get DMs all the time. They're like, wow, like the, your, your piece today made me cry or like episode blah, blah, blah was like so impactful. And I'm just like, wow. Um, I, someone emailed me a couple of months back and said that like, they were like close to, they were on the verge of like, they wanted to end their life and all this stuff. And then they listened to one of my episodes about hope and optimism and they decided not to stuff like that. I mean, makes it very real. Um, so obviously that would take the cake, but beyond that, it's just things that would people are like, Hey, okay. It's like, I like your podcast because you just seem like a real dude who's not trying too hard. And like that means everything to me that doesn't sound like high praise but like that's what i'm all about it's like i'm not an expert i'm not a guru i don't know everything i certainly don't know everything but i'm here to offer my perspective just as a 30 year old chill dude who lives in chicago and likes to wear ripped jeans and go to the club like that's that's my mo and that's what i set out to do and when people say that back to me it means a lot because i'm doing what i set out to do so between all that you know there's a lot of humbling value in the way that people respond to my podcast so it, it is i am very grateful for it all for sure absolutely what's the toughest feedback you've ever gotten because everybody has haters uh certainly um man i wish i had i honestly i wish i had more uh, it's been weird I'm like pe- people uh people people seem to be to be to give great feedback so i, I don't have a great answer there uh i've gotten i the podcast Gen- I j- really haven't gotten bad feedback from it. I've gotten some some haters for sure on pursuit. Um, people saying it's stupid. People saying it's annoying them. Um, I remember. Oh, I, I remember. I had a, a feature in Entrepreneur Magazine like two years ago that that was about myself, about what I've done with it. Um, it was a great article. It came out within like a couple hours. This guy on Twitter who was some marketer never heard of him but he had like twenty thousand followers or something was like he was going nuts on me he was going nuts on pursuit tweeting at entrepreneur tweeting everyone saying you know this is this this article is bs like these numbers aren't accurate this guy has no following it's a stupid idea like all these different things he was very very personally uh attacking me um and to this day no idea why don't even know the guy have no idea uh, but I, I always remember that guy as a hater but uh I think haters are interesting, man, because I look at someone like that. Um, and if he had emailed me, I would have emailed him right back and, and offered to chat with him. Uh, that I, I think anytime you, you have a hater, you honestly, you just have to feel a little bit sorry for them. There's clearly a lot of hate in their heart. They're obviously very frustrated with something. Um, and as long as you don't take it personally, I think it's easy to see that. If you can remove your, yourself emotionally from it and just see a very spiteful person online, it's, you know, that's, that's the way it is. So I, it's funny. I'm like struggling to come up with examples of haters, which I, I, need, I need more, obviously, because I need that experience. But in my experience, I've had very few. And when I have seen them, they've definitely been hurtful. But I think I have my head on right and just realizing that I, I honestly, I feel sorry for them. I feel bad for them. I wish they were happier people. <laughs> and that has kind of helped me deal with, with that. Absolutely. Uh, one of my friends from here in Edmonton, they gave me some pretty good advice. They said, your haters will never be greater than you. So when you think about that, it's, that. it's badass. It's true. And I was doing my, my research on you. I wanted to know as much as I could about sort of your background. So I saw the article in Entrepreneur and I think they put an edit in there. And it was like yeah. recently edited to show accurate uh, follower input or whatever. And I was like, yeah. Really? I, I, I actually remember that. So there was nothing inaccurate in the piece. That was the author of it who saw all these tweets going back and forth and was like freaking out. So he went back in and edited some things to make things super clear. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was a good, great dude. Uh, but yeah. I, I, yeah. I do remember that they included that. And that's, that's great. I mean, I think the thing that like I really pride myself in is, is being transparent. Certainly with the podcast, I'll say anything. I always, I say all the time, that I'm not some big baller entrepreneur. I'm not some guru. Um, I, I'm willing to disclose any numbers to anyone the majority of the time, as long as it's appropriate. So I never have been one to like want to hide behind anything. Um, but yeah, I, I remember. I remember that for sure. Well, it, it's so true. Like the more yourself that you can be, the better off you'll be in the long run. 
Um, like you can be anything you want, but as long as you are that 100% kind of thing and people yeah. will be able to pick up on that so much, which is probably like, I mean, the, the content of your podcast is perfect. Like there's, there's no reason to hate it. I, I found myself, I had an experience where I had just kind of started up my podcast. I think it was like 12 episodes in and then somebody went in and gave it one star and I was like, what the heck? Like one star? Uh -huh. Because mine yeah. is, is similar to yours. I, I don't hate on anybody. I don't take any political stances. It's all on like personal growth and overcoming like obstacles. And I was like, who would do a one star? And it's just like some people internally are just sad. Like they're they're not happy with themselves. That's exactly. That's exactly it. That is exactly it. Man. Yeah. They they reflect it outward. Yeah. It, it's sad though. You got to feel bad for them. It's like, I, I don't think I would ever do that. I would have to be in a dark place man just to want to do <laughs> something like that but it's like whatever i mean if someone wants to i mean i'm sure i don't even even check them out i'm sure i have some one stars and i'm sure it's the exact same thing i'm sure it's just someone either who feels threatened by the podcast or you know is just you know feeling down on themselves uh you know whatever everybody's gotta have have something yeah i've got um, a couple i've got a couple one stars damn it's all good <laughs> that's awesome so yeah. Your your mom was an author. What kind of books did she write? Uh, she wrote a lot of fiction. Yeah, yeah. Did you like? Was she writing them as you were growing up, or was it later on in your life? Uh, she she wrote them earlier on when I was growing up, like really young. So I was never really there for the process. Um, yeah. And now that she's she's older and retired, she's picking up again for sure. But she's she is a voracious reader. It's insane. That woman will read sun up to sundown. Like she's the most well read person I've ever met in my life. It's it's really crazy. And she she definitely instilled in me this idea of perspective. The more that perspective you can fill your mind with, the more that you could focus on areas in your life where you could take action, get real life perspective and go from there. So I definitely took that nod from her. So aside from perspective, list off four other things that your mom has influenced you in your your growth, your personal development. Uh, I will say she, I remember she has this quote that it will encapsulate all of that it is the uh, seven Ps, I think it is. Proper, pro uh, pr proper, pr proper prior preparation prevents poor performance was always her MO. Uh, growing up like i would i think again that was the reason why i say that i wasn't a nerd but i became one in my work ethic like she always instilled in me work ethic just not perfection in writing but a certain amount of pride in the work that you produce and just over preparing yourself for any creative field any business any academic thing and i think that's definitely spilled over in my life um you know i tend to be very prepared for the things that are important to me um, give them a lot of thought, give them a lot of intentional action, a lot of intentional planning beforehand. So yeah, I think, I think that those aspects of, of her personality definitely rubbed off on me for sure. That's awesome. Uh, how about your dad? Like, did, has he kind of played a pivotal role in your, in your growth and the big moves you've made? Yeah, he's, he's played a lot of a uh, role in, I'd say more personality driven things. Like I get my sense of humor from him. And if you know, Seinfeld, He's like he's like Jerry Seinfeld, like that that sense of personality, that that sense of humor is mine to a T, but it's his even more to a T. And I definitely got it from him. Um, I would say that. And then, like, I think about him and like his relationship in our family and, you know, being the, you know, the breadwinner um, when my my brother and I were born, my mom was a lawyer and then retired to take care of us. And then he's been working ever since. Like he does all the things that no one else wants to do. And I've always been so impressed by that. Like, uh, like I, I'm talking about little things like uh, go out and get the groceries or shovel the yard or whatever, like things that even I'll be like, no, let me do it. He like is more than willing to do it and not take any credit for it. And like, I've always seen that as like, no one wants to do the little things. No one wants to be the garbage man. No one wants to clean up. No one wants to do the little scrappy things, do your taxes, um, you know, those like little dirty things. And like, it's the little things that make you great. So I definitely learned that from him. Absolutely. That's a good one. Uh, how about yeah. your brother? Like what was, what was life like growing up with a brother that you're, you're close in age, you're probably competitive. Tell us. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all those things. We're pretty different people for sure. Like I was definitely more jockey than him. He was straight, straight academic, um, more or less, but smartest, smartest person I know in the world. Again, to my point, he went to Harvard, then he got a master's at Georgetown. He's now a, a cardiologist. He's a doctor. 
so insanely smart and creative and he, the guy's got a photographic memory and can literally do anything he wants. I've always just been impressed by him because here he is, this guy, he's a doctor and you would think, oh, doctor, you know, this guy's just focused on one field, but he's also an entrepreneur. He's also a, an investment trader. Like he does all these different things. And like, to me, I just, I'm always been inspired by that because yes, in life, at some point you're going to have to narrow down your focus out of necessity. But you also don't have to at the same time. Like the fact that he's been able to pursue his passions alongside of another passion, alongside of another passion, alongside of a traditional career. Like I love that. Like that's always spoken to me. And I, I kind of I'm doing the same, right? I still work a podcast. I write. I do all these different things. So I've definitely taken a nod from him as well. That's awesome. <clears throat> Uh, would you ever see yourself writing a book? Like I know you write content all the time, but what about like a full fledged published book? Yeah. Yeah. I will in the next two years. Um, that's been brought up numerous times. I've been contacted by several publishing houses to do it. Uh, I just need things to slow down a little bit in my life right now for me to yeah. really give the right attention to the book. So yeah, definitely within the next two years, I definitely want to make that happen. What do you think it would be about? That's a good question. I actually uh, had a couple ideas um, and have sat on them for a bit. Uh, you know, I was I was writing, toying around with some ideas around you know uh, how to how to find fulfillment in a nine to five because I've noticed that that's very tough for a lot of people. A lot of people um, are one struggle to find a job that makes them happy, or two struggle to find an outlet outside of their job that makes them happy alongside of something they have to do. So I think I've gotten very good at that. So I was going to write about that. Um, I don't know. It would definitely, I mean, at its core, it would certainly be about the power of your mindset to change. Um, I've, I've fundamentally proven that in my life and that's something that I'm very, very passionate about. I see it's the reason that I'm so adamant about trying my best to always be optimistic and glass half full because it's brought in so many great things into my life. Um, and it's I would, probably something around that, probably something around the way that you could train your train, train your mind, honestly, to help you think the way you want to think. And then once you're thinking in the right way, you take the right action. So probably something around that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna take some time to definitely think that through and make sure it's it's valuable. Absolutely. And then make sure you follow your gut too. Like if the gut says, Hey, screw it, let's just rate it, rate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every, everything goes together, man. Yeah, so for sure. Um, so everybody kinda has a support circle in their life, like people that they can kind of lean on. If you could list off a few people that like when you're making a major decision, like when you're deciding on pursuit what was going to happen what is the future like who do you consult with when when shit gets real yeah i mean definitely my parents for sure i I call them a lot i wouldn't say i'm like a mama's boy or anything like that but i i love them and i think they're very smart and they've seen a lot of things so any big decision i usually call them um but i have a couple close friends in chicago um that i always bounce ideas off of and you know they're you know, it's one thing to talk to your parents who are older and in a different state, but talk to someone else here who knows me like I am now um, and here in the current environment. Like that, that I, it's a combination of the two for sure. And honestly, this is going to sound weird. I would never obviously make a big decision in this way, but like I ask my followers a lot of the time when I'm trying to decide to do things. Like, should I do a podcast on this? Should I move to this city? When I'm here, what should I do? I do a lot of things like that. And I'm, humble to have a following that can help me with that but uh yeah i think uh, there's so many different ways to to get feedback in your life and you're never truly alone i mean but i start with my parents to answer it simply yeah that's awesome um and it's it's so true with like social media and stuff like when it comes down to it we put out so much content and if we are raw and real in ourselves and it's not like we're not preparing it uh people are buying into who we are authentically and yep. so they have an invested interest in us to see success because that's what they want to see, which makes it that much safer to kind of lean on them in some cases. Like maybe not like, should should I uh, take off life support? Should I let them live? Yeah. Maybe not a question like that, but like right. moving cities totally. Like they would be maybe your your next new neighbor if you moved cities, which totally. is awesome. Yeah, yeah man. I, I, I do that all, like – yeah, online, like, I meet up with people all the time online. Like, I'll, like so I'll be like, yo, I'm coming to Miami. Like, message me if you want to meet up. And then I'll do a quick audit of them to make sure <laughs> just that quick glance, they're not going to freaking kill me or anything. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm 
pretty open. I've met a lot of, I've gone on dates with girls. I've met new friends. Um, like I literally today just got back from doing a bunch of photography with a guy who just DM me. He was like, yo, I'm in Chicago. Um, well, I just hang out. I was like, all right, cool. So That's yeah, awesome. I mean, you, can't, you can't discount that. What's been like the most rewarding friendship that you've gotten from social media? Um, I, I would say, despite the fact that I'm technically not business partners with them anymore was my business partners. Like I met them on Instagram five years ago and we just connected over the fact that we were doing similar things. We were creating content and we were very much believed in the necessity to do it authentically. Yeah. Um, and I met these guys and they're, um, they're, they're older than me, 10 years, 15, 20 years old. There's three of them older than me. Um, and I just, I've learned so much from them just because they're very experienced entrepreneurs and they're very, they're just stand up guys. Like they're good principled people. Um, they're fathers, they have families, like they're just good people. So I like, I always looked up to them as kind of advisors, but also partners. So that that's definitely been the most rewarding. That's awesome. What's been the toughest thing that you've come across in social media? Cause it can be a really dark place sometimes. Like relative to me or just something that I've seen uh, relative to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, this isn't the best answer because I don't. I, I'd have to probably think about that for a second. But I did a post um, a couple months back, and I was like, "Hey, roast me! I want you guys to make fun of me." <laughs> and uh, in retrospect, I regret it a little bit, but I also don't because it it made me have a lot of tough skin. But some people said some things in there that I think were kind of tough for me. You know, I'm not perfect. I have insecurities. I have things I'm working on, and for people to uh, kind of reflect those in there, that was a little bit tough. Because, you know, here you can sit here and, and create and this craft, this brand image of you. And you think you've got everything figured out. You've got every insecurity hidden below the surface. And then you have people that are kind of calling you out for different things. Um, that was a little tough, but that, I mean, it really doesn't bother me. I, that's probably the best answer I could think of right now. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I would do another roast me again post, but it was definitely <laughs> a learning experience. Totally. Uh, have you ever seen uh, 8 Mile, the movie with them in it? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So one of my favorite parts about that is when he basically like they show him kind of coming up with one of his raps. He's up on the stage. And he basically completely roasts himself. And then once he's done that, nobody's oh, yeah. got anything on him. And that's yeah. like, I have used that for my own life so much. Like right now I'm 27. My hair thinned. I got kind of bald. So I just shaved the hair off and I had yeah. a couple people like, it. Oh man, like you, you're going bald. And like at this point in my life, I'm like, yeah, I am. So I shaved my head. Like, oh, well, yeah. no girls are going to want to go on a date with you. I'm like, ah, uh, to the contrary, I think you're wrong. Like, <laughs> there, there are a lot of like oh, male celebrities that are bald. Like, it is, huh. as are long you? as we don't have a problem with our insecurities, then they got nothing on us. Like, if we can call them yeah, out, next time you got to email that shit, like, list off the things that you think they're going to call out and just say now what do you have what do you got oh like, i like that dude that's <laughs> that's a great way to look at it yeah if you roast yourself no one else has anything on you that, that's great dude and yeah. like you're you're gonna feel <laughs> yeah. so much better you, you're gonna be like ah i got that off my chest that didn't really make any difference yeah. in the big picture did it yeah 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 i love that dude kudos yeah so uh talking about just life in general not just social media what's what's kind of like the toughest i want to talk obstacles and i want to talk about the toughest obstacle you've ever had to overcome and how you overcame it just in life in general yeah um uh, that's a good question man uh, it's tough for, it's it's weird for me because i like my life is really a lot related to my entrepreneurial and creative efforts. So I'll try to think of something outside of that because I can think of so many like challenges I have there. But um, I don't know. I mean, I think for me, like I had a relationship recently I was in for, you know, two plus years, lived together and that ended. Like that was very tough for sure because I had kind of built an identity around that. But I look back at that. That was a year ago at this point, And like I'm a totally different person now from that, like for the better. Like I realized that that, the identity in that relationship really wasn't my potential at all. Like not at all at all. I had become so comfortable and settled in that respect. Um, so it was really tough, but then coming out of it, like so, so much better. Um, and like, I'm I, like, I'm so grateful for, for that experience. Like could not be more grateful. Like I probably wouldn't have started this podcast. If I was still in that relationship, I probably would have folded pursuit. If I was still in that relationship, like it just wasn't, I wasn't, energized it wasn't uh, inspired to do my creative thing so 
um, yeah, I'd say that, that that was really tough. But like, like there's a, I have other examples too. But I mean, it's like you think about those bad experiences. I've always found good things have come from them. And I know that's a very cliche blanket thing to say, but like it's true. I can't really think of a single bad experience in my life that was just bad. There's always good that has come from it, even if it's the good in the form of perspective that now makes me stronger or more centered or more aware or whatever. Like I've always found that to be true. Being able to take everything as a learning experience is pretty empowering. Like uh, I can relate to your experience. Basically what threw me into the fitness industry was a relationship coming to an end. It was like, it was, it was common. It it had to to happen and it all makes sense and there's no hard feelings. But had that not happened to me, I would not have like thrust myself into finding like who I was as a person. Like I just, I started going to fitness classes, like spin classes, CrossFit classes, like crazy. And the whole intent was to burn myself out just so that I wouldn't, I I didn't want to have the energy to worry about stresses. I had stuff going on with like my, my condo, there was basement suites foreclosing, tons of stress. And I just wanted to be at a place where I couldn't think of, of what was stressing me out anymore. And then that turned into a whole career. Like I quit my old job. I uh, work for myself as an independent training contractor. I uh, sometimes I work at the bar because you gotta you gotta keep the dream alive somehow. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But I I totally yeah, man. Every yeah. every Same shitty rep- situation. Rep- yeah, yeah. I mean, that's to your point. That it is the most empowering thing you could do. It's not always realistic. It's not always easy to be like up oh, there's good out of this you get in a car accident well there's good at like it's tough like it's not realistic always but yeah man if you can get to the point where you're centered enough to realize that it empowers you to then be just be stronger and more resilient like yeah you you can't lose with that mentality absolutely like that that's a big vision for for my podcast here is i try to get guests that kind of they're living a life that they feel is fulfilling whether they're famous or not famous whether they're doctors or maybe they're uh paramedics or whichever and i find sort of what keeps them whole what keeps them grounded i talk about their background i talk about like different struggles that they've had to overcome and the end product is hopefully to inspire other people to find the best in themselves and so that's i think that's why i've enjoyed yours because yours gives me a whole different perspective so that I'm not just like hearing my own voice all the time. And Good. Like, yours is like perfect length. So I can like listen to it on the way uh, to a workout or something. Nice. Like yeah. 20, 30 minutes. Right on. Um, I appreciate that. You bet. I'm going to take this to a question that I ask all of my guests. And it is what one piece of advice would you give to our listeners on how to authentically live your life to the fullest? Yeah, I would say in direct contradiction of my whole premise, which is training your brain, training your mindset, improving your mindset, is to realize that, yes, you should you should get your mindset as right as you can. Fill it with, uh, with as much perspective as you can. Listen to as many podcasts as you can. Read as much as you can. Meet as many people as you can. Understand their stories. Understand their points of view. Use that to optimize your mindset. But if it ends there you're never going to reach your potential. Like you can, it gets you to the one yard line. Like the way to grow in life is to do is to act. And I, that is cliche in and of itself, but I've proven this time and time again. Like you can't think yourself into success. You can't think yourself into improving. You can't think yourself into change. Like it's not going to happen. You have to act on that in some way. It could be as simple, you know, if you want to be more confident, yeah, you could read all the articles you want on what that means. You can listen to my podcast on the big dick energy, what that means. Or yes, I say yes, do that. But then you have to take it out into the world. You have to challenge yourself. You have to make yourself awkward and embarrassed. You have to go up to people and say hi. Like you have to do all those things. And when you realize that, that living your your most fulfilling badass life is equal parts mindset, equal parts action, then then there's nothing that will stop you because once you combine that action with what we just talked about and the resilience of seeing the upside of every experience, it's like it is full circle and it is the greatest thing I think you can ever experience. Yeah, so I think it's just that, realizing that pushing yourself, becoming your best self, living your most fulfilling life is all about half mindset, half action. That's awesome. I love that. 
So I got to thank you for joining me and we'll uh, catch, uh, catch you next time. Cool, man. I appreciate it. This is great. Yeah. Straight to the point. I love it. <laughs>